Chesterton Norman and Chan. If you got it, say, I got it. If you look and say, help the law. Help the law. Sometimes you gotta say, help the law. Hallelujah. Help me, Lord. It says, like this reading from the king. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put all on your head. Wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. He says, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret reward you openly. Again, he says, put all on your head. Verse 17, wash your face. So it will not be obvious that others, that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I can say the word for the From the time this man, from this few moments that I've given me, I want to talk a little bit about why the ashes. Why the ashes. Thank you for being here, Minister Kushta. Thank you for being here. Why the ashes. It's interesting to me that we would mark our foreheads with ashes to commemorate this wonderful opportunity for us to show that we are on the Lord's side. It's an opportunity for us to, to show that we are in a season that we call Lent, that we are fasting and we are repentance and we are in prayer and we are in self-control. And that's when we mark ourselves with the ashes, it's to say that we're on the same team, working for the opportunity for us to go to a better place. That means that we have an opportunity to be here in a season which we call a soul cleansing time. It's also a spiritual benefit from, from this fasting. It says that when you do this spiritual fasting, it is similar to those regular dieting fasts. It says also when you fast, it gives your body an opportunity to reset itself. It gives your, your, your digestive tract an opportunity to have a breather from you putting on that beating all the time. It gives an opportunity for your digestive tract to take a breather. So therefore, when you fast, it gives your body a reset time, a cleansing time, a washing time. Gives you an opportunity for you to have an opportunity to have She said, well, I, I love this season because I can evaluate where I am and where I'm going. Papa oh. told me she does a self-evaluation of herself. She goes to the mirror and says, all right now, what I'm doing good, oh. what I'm doing bad. When you self-evaluation, you got to be honest with yourself and say, what am I doing to, to prosper and what am I doing to, to de-prosper myself? If you he says, when you take an evaluation of yourself, you must be totally honest. What can I do better to help myself? Where am I weakest at? Where am I strength at? You got to ask yourself these questions. Do I need rehab and who can help me to be better? This is an opportunity for you to look and see, am I struggling? And where am I struggling at? So when you do a soul cleansing, it's an opportunity for you to, to ask yourself some questions about oneself. How can I increase my focus? How can I be better than what I wrote last year? How can I open up my mind to the spirit? 
spirituality to that level before. What can I do to be a blessing before God? Some people find that a spiritual fast is helping way to manage life difficult situations. When you go to a spiritual fast, you ask that God help me because I can't do it without myself. And that's this. Uh, uh, I was talking to uh, Dr. Sylvia McGee. I said, how did you able to manage all those schools and all those places? She said, I first used to do it by my gut feeling. She said, I would, I would manage all of my gut. She said, but then my mentor saying, what are you doing? She says, I'm hoping. She said, he says, hope is intentional. And all for you to have hope, it must be an intent. It must be intentional. So he says, stop going your gut and be
You got a sense of sense of purpose and direction. When you struggle with making choices in life, God can help you to find yourself and get off the right track. Overcoming crisis and addiction, holistic health and wellness treatment, all this comes from spiritual fasting. Yeah. So when you fast, you got not to be complaining about it. Exactly. It bothers me the folks say, well, you know what I'm doing. I can't eat that right now. You know what I'm doing. What he just told you. He says, this is the secret thing between me and you. Folk uh -huh. offer you stuff, you know what you see. Find some time with me. Put that plate down. Give your body a rest. Give me some time. Yes. So get up early in the morning. Find some time with me. Give me your first moment, your first thought. Give me your first moment to wake up. Yes. Get up and find time just to talk to me. I don't care if you're falling asleep, but you try to be with me. Find some time to work with him. Because he says, in order for you to do this thing, you got to really do it. You got to really be focused on it. Don't do it. Don't do it because somebody else doing it. Do it because you want to find yourself getting closer to the awesome wonder in our lives. Yes. You got to stop fixing your face. And God knows, don't go to Satan while you're fasting. That's the devil right there. <laughs> repentance is the number two thing. The most common translation of repent is a term. The most common repent is a turn. It's a turn, not a return, but a turn. The two prerequisites of repentance include the sub and the turn away from evil and turn to good. Most critical theology is the idea of returning to God. The turn is away from your situation and to have some God. It's a turn that helps you to say, it is not Repent! Turn from your idol and renounce all your detestable practices. Repent! Turn away from all your offenses. Turn away from all your evil ways. Such a call was characteristic of the practice. How did repent? Tell God I'm sorry. Screwed up, God, I'm sorry. Messed up. It, it has two senses, a change of mind. 
I, I, I found myself kind of fixed for you when I know better, I all of do better. Paul said to have preached both to Jews, Gentiles, and Greeks to turn to God and repent and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Repent is only a condition of salvation, not just meritorious goodness of God and divine love, but it's pleading desire to have sinners saved. In the available consequences of sin, in the universal demands of the gospel, in the hope of spiritual life, the membership in the kingdom of heaven. Who won't go? Who's got to go? Who cares to go? They have a membership in the kingdom of heaven. True repentance leads to a person to say, I sin. He proved it a hundred and eighty degree change from my direction. If my people call out like that, talk back to me when I'm talking to you, humble themselves. Pray, seek my face. You gotta make a turn. You gotta make a turn. You gotta self evaluate yourself and make a turn. You gotta make a turn and find yourself in a better position. You gotta make a turn. I went to the village today and he told me, he says, What I wanna do is I wanna make a, 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 a mold of your home. So I can evaluate what's our next step in this situation with God. He said, I'm going to do a quick thing by taking what I think now, but let me make the mold first. That I can look into the mold and see what your mouth will look like. See, I, what repentance is, what, what this is, is, is for you to make a mold. So you can look back and look into it and say, no, let's go right there. I screwed it right there. Says if you make the turn from your wicked ways, he says, then I don't know about you, but I need a then on my life. Then he says, then when I hear from heaven, I will forgive the sins and heal the land. Repentance. Repentance requires true brokenness. I told you you got to, sometimes you gotta holler sometimes when you give us some stuff you really know. There's some stuff you wish you, you should have gave a long time ago, but it hurt to let it go. Repentance is not asking the Lord for forgiveness with the intent to sin again. But it's required for you to, from your heart, say, help me that I won't do this no more. Repentance is an honest, regretful acknowledgement of sin with the commitment to change. So just ask for forgiveness and then do the same thing again. The prisoners lead to cultivate godliness a while eradicate habits that lead us into sin. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all of our unrighteousness. When we repent, you gotta be asking God to help me that I won't do this no more. And then you gotta put things in places to help you not to do it no more. Sometimes you gotta put people in places. Yes. Friend of mine struggle with addiction. I said, that's what a sponsor's for. You call a sponsor and tell them when you get weak, no matter what time it is, you call that sponsor. And that sponsor's supposed to get up and talk to you and walk you through the steps of keeping you from going the other way. That's what a sponsor do. Every time you feel like you're weak, you call your sponsor and say, look, I'm feeling weak, help me. You say, I can't pick you up and take you for a ride. Or I can't take you to the store. Or I'll be with you the next day. That's what your sponsor do. So let me ask you, how do you need a sponsor? Oh, my God. Help me that I won't do this no more. I don't know about you, but God gave us a sponsor. And he's always ready, always there. All we have to do is call him in the world. Then he says, repentance brings on this prayer thing. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man than the one. Just for a moment, the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man. I mean, he says, I'm looking for somebody to talk to me from the heart. We got to make no prayer up. 
Y'all ever heard this? Talk to him. Yeah. I'm the only boy. That boy was your head. And I'm struggling. And I need you to help me. Simplify the process. You ain't got to make it all other one. Just talk from your heart. Yeah. Tell God from your heart what you need. It can be fat and firm if you just talk from your heart. John says in 514, he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Next thing I don't know about you, but I need God to hear me. So therefore, I want to talk to him from my heart. Sometimes it might not come through my talking, but I may crank an old song. Sometimes I may come out with praise out of me. Sometimes I just want to walk to him that way. Sometimes I might go the other way and come another way and say, Lord, I don't want to talk to you in my own words. It might not be the song they wrote. That was what they felt. Some of y'all went to me and I wrote like that. That's why I didn't write that song. I wrote mine. I just used that to get music. That might not sound like that, but this is how I felt about God. That's how they felt when they wrote it. But let me write my song, but let me just borrow your music. You talk to him. You tell him what you're going to do. Sometimes you can't talk because you're a practical, but you can say it about him. Tell God. Last but not least, and I'm out of here. He says, this takes self-control. Why the ashes? That's just when you got self-control. The Bible warns us that if we do not have self-control, we will be slaves of that what controls us. If we ain't got self-control, some stuff that you won't do, you'll do if you ain't got self-control. Sometimes we weep when we had a restaurant. Somebody comes up to you and say, what she want? <laughs> you tired of all you want something good to eat? And they trick you. You trying to keep that woman from running all over them. Knowing they got to bring back your food. Self-control. Just because they say this guy was selling on them means you got to buy it, do it. Y'all got quiet on that. Self-control. Just because they got two for one doesn't mean you got to eat both of them, doesn't it? Self-control. He says, we got to have self-control over food, lust, money, and our words, whatever it is that causes you not to see God straight. We don't put the law. off. We stole. We think we don't just trip out because it's easier to go off than to, to, than to be able to get an understanding. He said, but all of us get just some understanding. I mean, you get some understanding. Yes, yes. I mean, I, mean I, I tell this story all the time about my fussy neighbor. She would fuss me out because we shared a driveway before I moved. And whenever I would put groceries in the house and leave my truck with the car in the yard, she would meet me at the door, fuss me out about my car being in the driveway. Now, mind you, she ain't going nowhere. She gets fussy because my car is in the driveway. So I would look at her and she would say stuff like, and you're supposed to be a preacher. I'm saying, what am I calling the driveway? <laughs> so then God told me she's lonely. And the only time she can talk to you, she finds things to fuss about so she can talk to you. That's how she communicates to me. So I would never fuss at her. I would sit there and do the thing smiling. And she would say stuff like, I don't see that fight. I'm like, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm so sorry. Let me get my keys and move every kind of way. Go out there and bother you. I might be a little bit, you know me. I might be a little crazy with it. But I'll be tripping the whole time she'd be fussing. And, and, and when he told me what, what she was going through, I stopped laughing then. Because I felt like she thought I'm about to be laughing at her. And I was, I was just laughing because she was fussing about a car and she wasn't going nowhere. However, when she did, I stopped laughing and I began to think, what can I do to make her? How could I help her that she won't feel like she could come right my doorbell when she won't talk to me? So what she did one day, when she finished the bus, I said, in time you want to talk to me, you call me, I'll ring the doorbell, and I'll, I'll come over and hit my phone and call me. You can fuss if you want to, I just got to talk to you. She started laughing. It changed our whole relationship. Because I was willing for God to use me. I was looking for God to help me when somebody was hurting and not hurt them back because they didn't want to hurt it. But they didn't know how to be, tell you they were hurting or they hurt you. So therefore, I learned before hurting, it ain't about you, they hurt it. And he helped for you to be.
be able to be used by God to help them. And if you're useful, God will tell you how to help those that are hurting because He sent you there for a reason. See, I, I, I moved there for a reason. I thought I moved there because I need not to be homeless. But it was. He wanted her to soften up. And she would be able to talk to other folks. So God will put you on a place to be used that you can help somebody with if you're useful. If God can reach you, you can reach somebody else. If God can reach you, you can reach somebody else. If God can reach you, you can reach one. Each one got to reach one. But you can reach one if you ain't got control to stop and think and ask God, what are they going on for me? I don't even know that well. Because they see in you what God sees in you. And they come to get some church out of your church. And the worst thing you can do is bring them that nation out of your church. Child of God. God ashes. You got the cross on your head because he know redemption and redeemer that lives in you because you can help those that feel unforgiven to forgive and forgive them again. You can help folks that be where you are, know how you look when you used to be, to help them to believe if I made it truly. God will help you if you will open up your mouth and say, look, I used to be. I ain't no more. But I don't forget where I come from. But I tell you, I'll reach out to you, not down and tell you, if I came that way, surely you can come this way. When you got self-control, you will stop the faith. Why am I here? What am I doing? What's my purpose? God is always on a mission. He's always mission-minded.
always need you. Our leadership needs you. God will need you every step of your life. We've got so much going on, Lord. All over this world. Seems like it's getting worse than every moment. Seems like we have forgotten the very core of things that brought us thus far. But you're the same God. Oh my God. You're the same God. You're the same God. You're the same God that brought my family across the water. You're the same God. Thank you. 